Hello, everyone. I'm Lou Marciani, the director of the Innovation Institute for Fan Experience and the host of Fan Centric Podcast Series. The Fan Centric Series is all about the fans. What do fans want and need when they attend sports and entertainment events, including stadiums, esports events, endurance events, concerts, and festivals and stadiums? Our series takes the journey with the fans as they leave home arrive at the venue enjoy the event and return home we also discuss technology trains trends medical advice industry gaps real world experiences and technologies that address challenges facing the sports and entertainment industry and their fans our goal is to help sports and entertainment industry focus on the fans our guest today for our podcast series is Matt Payne, founder of uh, Inner Circle and a distinguished fellow for the Innovation Institute for Fan Experience with emphasis in esports. He has 30 years experience identifying and managing security risks. So uh, Matt, uh, what's your uh, daily life like look like? <laughs> so we, uh, and thanks Lou, thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so Inner Circle Solutions, we're a security and intelligence firm. Um, we're consultings that, uh, consultants that uh, specialize in crisis management, um, investigations, physical security, um, event security to include esports. So, you know, our day could be any number of things, managing COVID for companies to threat uh, management for other companies, doing threat and risk assessments. Um, you know, we had some people come to us and they're in the process of building um, specific esports stadiums, and they want us to consult on that from a both the security, environmental health and safety, emergency response perspective. Um, so, you know, it's a it's a really diverse organization. Um, we have everything from cybersecurity professionals to, um, you know, executive protection people that had been in the service and, uh, you know, just a variety of, of experiences um, that we bring to the table. And um, luckily for us, we are um, doing a lot of work in esports and, um, you know, really starting to lay some groundwork and some foundation for esports in general, which I'm sure we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but that's really us. It's, it's a really, especially now with COVID, there's a lot of companies that have been out. Now they're looking to come back to work. And they're trying to figure out, hey, what does it look like? What are we doing? How are we going to do it? And you have some companies that are actually even onboarding their, their employees again, just like they've never been there because they've been out of work for or out of the office for two years, right? Not out of work, but out of the office. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, different um, what we knew two years ago and what we're going to know next year are going to be a little bit of the same, but probably a lot different. And um, that's the exciting part is we can get and follow this journey along as it happens. Yeah. You know, speaking of the pandemic, uh, has esports been accelerated because of the pandemic? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, there's there's been a lot of virtual um, events and a lot of streaming as especially when the children were home and doing homeschool, you know, and a lot of the places around the world were on virtual school for a long, long time. Um, you know, my kids, the entire year last year was done virtually. And, um, you know, when you look at the numbers of, you know, how many people are streaming and and um, and just watching and viewing esports or Twitch or YouTube or, or any of the other platforms, you know, um, I just I, I looked before this and about twenty six point six million viewers um, per month are viewing right now. Um, you know, something to do with esports, and it could be a tournament, it could be just watching, streaming, it could be any number of different things. So, um, you know, and that'll shift a little bit as um, things start opening back up, and we have started to have live events again. Um, you know, and you probably see some of that um, online experience fall a little bit, but then they're doing stuff in person, so it's just a shift in dichotomy there with uh, with how the venue is is looking. 
Well, that's maybe where the value comes in uh, between us and with your leadership as we prepare for the return of live events and esports. What, in your opinion, needs to be uh, done in advance of uh, the, the swing? So, you know, we are in the process right now of building some trainings that we hope to have a, um, I guess, a foundational guidance set for what is esports and how should we be securing an esport event and what should we be looking at with regards to esports. And um, I just did a video for um, Inner Circle uh, two weeks ago, and the subject of the video was, is an event the same as an esports event? And I would argue, no, it's not. And when I say an event, I, I, I will call it a traditional event, uh, a professional sporting event, a college collegiate event, a concert, something along those lines. And, you know, just real quick, there's three different nuances that come off to the top of my head right away. One is access to your hero, right? Whether it's a wide receiver or a streamer in esports. In a normal conventional, you potentially could see them if you're at a media event or you get a on-field pass or you're in the tunnel where they're walking and maybe you get a high five as they're going by. From an esports perspective, the, um, the players and the influencers, their whole job is around um, being in public, being with their people. So at an esports event, you will often get somebody that will tweet or send out a message on any number of different platforms and say, hey, I'm going to be at section 32D, come up and say hi. Well, then thousands of people come up because they want to see the player. And now you have a whole interaction that takes place. Um, esports events have fan experiences outdoors that put the, the attendee and the fan in the game in some manner. It could be a zip line. It could be a bowler ball. It could be a shooting competition. It could be any number of different things. The NFL does it. They do a fan experience for the Super Bowl, but a lot of these events are doing fan experiences for every single one of them. And now you have a separation of your populace, right? Some inside, some outside. You have weather events. You can have any number of different things there. Then the third would be mom and dad who has a 14, 15 year old child that has made it to the final of a competition for whatever esport it is. And maybe that competition is in Madrid and mom and dad have never traveled before. You know, the child has never traveled before, probably in the country or in the state, but not internationally. And it brings on a whole different set of circumstances there. So we're trying to build training programs that fit the parents and the players, the venue security directors, the hotel security directors, and then the security director for whatever gaming company it is to help them with securing an event and making it safe, but having a great fan experience at the same time. Now, do you uh, see best practices being created uh, out of the Institute as well? Yes. And the beauty of the Institute is, um, you know, you have what, and I'm just going to make up a number out of the ambassadors that we have and the fellows and everybody, you know, let's just say there's 600 years of experience that we have everything from Olympic sports to Super Bowls to whatever. And as we build this, my, in my vision is to present it to the organization and say, take a look at this and pick it apart and let's make the best um, set of standards we can. And then, then we would publish them out with all the experience that we've leveraged and all of the learnings, you know, just look at Travis Scott, right? That unfortunate event is going to have a world of change for an event come months from now, right? When they figure out exactly what happened and how to stop that, right? right? Or, or uh, you know, reduce the possibility of it happening again. Um, so we always have to be doing continuous improvement. And then we always have to be coming back in and looking at our standards, making sure that we are keeping them up to where they should be. But the, the Institute is where we're really going to get the, the oomph behind it. How do we uh, get the buy-in of the industry for the best practices on that? I, I think it's, um, it's a combination of things. I, I think it's um, using scenarios 
and unique circumstances that have come up and that this has proven to um, help us secure that. It's also understanding the, um, uh, I guess, the concerns that the industry is facing yeah. and making sure that we are adapting ours to meet those concerns. Yeah. And those concerns are going to be ever changing, right? So that's why we have to maintain on top of things. Yeah. No. So it's going to be a multi tiered approach. Yeah, it is. Do you see yourself maybe forming an advisory committee of uh, stakeholders in the industry to help you? So we do right now, we have a, it's called the, we've called it the game safe group. And we have um, a lot of the security directors for the major gaming companies are, are together. Um, we meet periodically um, and we're not talking about anything, um, you know, of trade secret or anything like that. This is really sharing our experiences and helping each other. Um, so you're not reinventing the wheel. And um, I would, I would envision us getting more, um kind of focused with things and more um organized i guess right now it's been a little loose because of covid you know there's not a lot of people doing every you know doing anything everybody's working from home um but i i envision us getting back into a good sync with things as things start coming back and making it um into a more formalized group than what it has been um, you know, with, and, and, you know, we, we read an antitrust statement. We do a lot of different things that, you know, the lawyers want us to do because there's a lot of concern when you're pulling competition in together, but at the same time, that's what security is about. It's not a competition. It is how do we share our experiences? So something that happened here doesn't happen there. Oh, right. Yeah. No, no question. When, when, uh, a person's organizing the event. What are the challenges that they're going to they face? You think? So, I mean, it could be anything from venue selection to language barriers. So, you know, you got to think about it, right? If if we're going to hold an event, is the event going to be a world championship where people are going to fly in from all around the world, and or is it going to be a regional? which is going to be only in Germany, let's say, and we're going to pick a city in Germany. Um, so there's, there's nuances with that. There's language issues. There's um, local um, ordinance issues that you're going to have to deal with. Um, and, you know, and then on top of that, you're going to have all of the things that come with the event. And there's no two events that are similar, right? And what Epic does is different than what EA does, which is different than what Riot does. But in essence, the big thing from a security perspective is maintain a safe and secure environment that is going to let the fans have a great experience and then have a successful competition on top of that, yeah. right? So there's a lot of different challenges that come into it. Local law enforcement, intelligence, threat management, um, you know, emergency response, all of that is gonna come in and it's gonna take planning and it's going to take a lot of coordination and cooperation in order to make that a good, safe event. You think uh, the organizers have any guidance, or they're just on their own? You know, they're on their own, and, and they just think because I I love gaming, I, I want to put on an event. Do they? Is there any uh, uh, certifications for these folks, or you know, anything along um, those lines? No, it's uh, you know, often you will get the marketing team that'll come out and say, hey, we're gonna hold a competition. And, um, you know, if it's done right, they will pick five cities, go to security and say, hey, out of these five cities, could you do a risk assessment of these five cities during these dates? And, you know, then your security team will go out and your intelligence team will go out and figure out what is going on in that city. Is there any unintended consequences Right. What has historically gone on in that in that country? What does the weather look like? What does you know all of that look like? And then come back with a risk ranking and say, if you were going to ask me, here are the cities. Then they would say, OK, we want to do it here. Here are six venues. Can you go back out and do the same exact thing? Let me go through my risk assessment and let me figure out which one of these events or uh, venues we would do and rank them in order. Then you come up with a good event. So. You know, it, it's a lot of coordination, but there's not really a certification. There's not really a, um, 
you know, it, it's a lot of coordination between marketing, your social team, and your security teams to make sure that, and the worst thing that can do is, hey, we're going to hold a, 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 an event at this venue in this city at this date, make it work, right? Okay. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, down the road, uh, some type of uh, event certification that mm -hmm. makes sure that we, we, you know, checklist it out and making sure that whoever takes that responsibility on could be a role of uh, IIF and uh, you uh, down the road as well, you know? Uh, yeah, so... So the training that we've that we thought about and what I what I envision long term is becoming esports certified. Right. So I've taken the training. My player base has taken it. Whoever wants to my venue security, my hotel, my security director has taken it. Now I would list it as esports certified because they've they understand the standards and kind of the, the framework. And so exactly what you said, that's what I would envision long term. We agree whole, wholeheartedly. You know, I was looking the other day, uh, we're talking about 3.5 billion, not millions, billion dollar mm -hmm. industry by 2025. Mm -hmm. I'm going to repeat that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. You know, we talk about sports and all the time. We're talking about 3.5 billion dollar industry by 2025. Yep. All right. Yep. Now, that means there's threats. What are yep. the big threats that, that we have to look at and consider her? So it's, um, I mean, you always have the players, right? And, and you have, you're dealing with a variety of age, age ranges um, with, you know, they're not necessarily all adults. They're not necessarily all teenagers. They could be young children that are playing. And, you know, it, you can get anything from, oh man, I didn't make this, I'm going to kill myself to, oh man, I didn't make this, I'm going to come and blow up your headquarters. Um, you also could have, um, let's just say we were going to hold an event at the same time another professional sports event was going to be held and let's move it into any location that you want and let's just go with a terrorist act. Well, would I go to something that is here that I know is a professional sports and let's say it's a soccer stadium or something like that, that, you know, has been doing this for a long time, or do I go over here and hit these little esports guys and I'm still going to disrupt the city. I'm still going to cause havoc. Where is my likely target would be right. It, it could be here because they don't, this is a new experience, right? How much do these guys know from a, a terrorist standpoint, right? So there's the threats can come in, long and wild. Um, you know, you had the Madden event where the gentleman lost the game, went out to his car, got a weapon, came back in, shot the place up, killed a bunch of people. Um, there's a variety of different things that have taken place around the world. Um, everything from swatting and swatting is when, um, you know, Lou and Lou beat me at a competition last week. I know Lou is going to stream from his home every Tuesday at four o'clock. I pick up the phone, I call lo hit local law enforcement in Lou's city, and I say, um, there's a hostage situation at Lou's address. Law enforcement shows up, kicks in the door, and now Lou, in the middle of his podcast or in the middle of his streaming, has guns in his face, and that's called swatting. Um, there have been people killed with swatting. Um, you know, one of my big fears was that somebody was going to swat our player hotel and disrupt our entire event. Um, with players out the street for five or six hours, um, you know, with a bomb threat, a gas leak, whatever it is. Um, so the threats can come in all kinds of places. You need to expand your perimeter. You need to get your intelligence out, identify it early so you can put your emergency response and crisis management plans together and they will handle it outside before it becomes an issue inside. Yeah, I, I feel what, from what you're saying, I, I go back to 9-11, <clears throat> I go back to the all the work we did, you know, years afterwards and hardening our venues and uh, looking at our perimeters and do extensive training exercises. I feel from your conversation today, we're, we're, that's where we were. And, and I think we have, to t we, we have an obligation to take this, this new emerging sport and really uh, start from that perspective and build out some good curriculums like you, you, you want to do. Uh, build out the uh, exercises, uh, mm -hmm. working with the companies, 
uh, working with the hotel industry, most importantly, you know, working with the uh, the venue uh, operators and the mm-hmm. family. I think the fa- this is a family entity here. So yep. we have a, a pathway, which you're, mm-hmm. you're driving us to. Uh, in a way, the pandemic is helping us because we have time now to uh, really uh, create and, uh, and soon to implement uh, a model. I think uh, I think one of your suggestions is that uh, we we take on a, a an event as a as a project to, from A to Z, right? And, and and really massage it and make it the model of the, of our country or really the world, and, and uh, build it out so that as we go down the road, uh, we're providing that safe and, se- and secure environment so the sport can grow. Uh, there's a, you you said it right. You said it really really well again, Matt, about the threats. I'm even thinking match fixing. I'm thinking even on that side is money. The money is is heavy here coming in from uh, about 70% of the money is coming in from sponsorships and advertising. You got money coming in from in-game purchases, merchandise, live event, ticket sales, media rights. This is massive, massive. So there's a lot at stake here for the entire industry. And I applaud you for, um, uh, leading uh, as we uh, embrace this uh, the, this uh, sport here at the Institute, work very closely with you and, and the stakeholders and the subject matter experts to really make a difference in the industry. So I think the, the, the gist of this uh, podcast is to, is to let the world know that, uh, Matt, that uh, you've, you've taken some leadership here in the past and as we get back to live events in 22, 23, that uh, we we have a chance, all of us, to work to make the sport better. Yep, and uh, you know the the sport is ever changing. Right now, you have venues that are specific to esports. Right, they're not they're, they're not built for anything else. They're built for esports. You have colleges that have esports teams and there's leagues. You have curriculums that are built around esports. Right, this is a mainstream. Um, phenomenon that started with a couple of kids in front of a computer saying who's better at what, and now look where it is. Like you said, you know, four billion dollars, three three and a half billion dollars from yeah. by twenty twenty five. So you know, it's it's big. I uh, what it was you had me thinking too uh, of additional ideas of uh, maybe uh, at some of our college facilities. I know University of Arizona, a few others. You're talking about all in. Uh, yep. Do we do we work with them and putting on some workshops, for instance, to uh, uh, enhance what you're trying to do as well? Yeah, yeah. And the other the other piece that I've uh, um, you know been kind of exploring is what is the appetite out there? Would mom and dad and player you know entertain coming and taking some training about things? Um, you know, does the venue director look at things, or does he hold up his hand and say, "Hey, we've done this for a long time. We're good at this." You know, we don't necessarily need this. Right. Or yeah. how do you build the buy in? And I think the, from the experiences that we have, the learnings that we have, the experience from the institute that we have behind us really shows that this should be what you're doing in order to have a good event. Now, is this the only way? Absolutely not. But will it help you re- uh, mitigate some of your risks in your event? Absolutely, Absolutely, because we have X number of years behind us that show proven success in what we're doing. Uh, Matt, I think we have a formula. And yep. I, I want to thank you for uh, taking on this leadership and uh, and working closely with the uh, Institute, because I think we, we're, our goal here is really to make a difference so the sport can grow in a healthy way. And right. in safety and security, and the and ex, the experience of the family. I, I'm going to say family right away. Yep. Because yep. it is a family endeavor, and uh, let's see what we can do. So, thank you for taking the time to be with us on the podcast today, and uh, appreciate your leadership. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Lou. I really appreciate the opportunity, and and welcome any other input that we have. And I look forward to a, a long journey together in in building this out. So, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.